I'm extremely pleased to be able to welcome and recognize a number of our board members. Another former co-chair, Nancy Newcomb, Glenn Louie, Sue Ann Weinberg, and a co-chair of our Chairman's Council, which we're celebrating this evening, Carl Mangus. And I'd like to thank all of them for the very hard work and great effort and energy that they put in to this wonderful institution. I have particular pleasure this evening to introduce a person who has become a close friend, great colleague, and true inspiration to me, um, and a poker and prodder at the same time. His name is Dr. James Basker, and he is going to introduce our distinguished speaker this evening. Uh, Jim is, as I think most, if not all of you know, the president of the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History, and he also bears the august title of Richard Gilder, Professor of Literary History at Barnard College and Columbia University. Jim. Thank you, Louise, and um, thank you all the members of the staff at the New York Historical Society who've arranged such a a lovely evening and organized things so well. Um, as many of you know, uh, the Richard Gilder Distinguished History Lectures have been endowed by Lewis Lehrman, uh, who asked me to take his part this evening in introducing our speaker. He endowed them in tribute to Mr. Gilder uh, as a great lover and benefactor of American history. And he's already been recognized, but it's uh, impossible to give him enough uh, credit for all that he's done in moving us forward on American history and especially on education in support of history around the country as well as in New York. Uh, the purpose of the lectures was to bring the most distinguished historians of our time to the New York Historical Society for public lectures, which will afterwards be published in book form. Um, and these lectures will be published by Yale University Press. This year, as you know, is the inaugural of what is to be an annual series. Some of you, perhaps all of you, were here for the first two lectures delivered by uh, Bernard Balin of Harvard and James McPherson of Princeton. In fact, we were talking earlier about how we've hit the trifecta uh, of Harvard, Princeton, and Yale this evening. It is my privilege to introduce the third of the inaugural uh, distinguished historians, John Lewis Gaddis. Mr. Gaddis is the Robert A. Lovett Professor of Military and Naval History at Yale University and a distinguished fellow of the Brady Johnson Grand Strategy Program, which he also directs. In his remarkable career, Professor Gaddis has taught at Ohio University, the Naval War College, Princeton University, the University of Helsinki, Oxford University, and now uh, for several years, of course, at Yale. He has produced many seminal books in the field of Cold War history, from the United States and the Origins of the Cold War, published in 1972, and interestingly, the second edition was published in 2000, um, and Strategies of Containment, published in 1982, second edition in 2005, and I find it remarkable that a man writing about history that was uh, so contemporary with his own writing should, 25 years later, um, be republished uh, as if confirming uh, the accuracy of his vision at that time. It's truly exceptional. From those early books to his most recent works, The Landscape of History, How Historians Map the Past, which I think was the subject of his talk the last time he was here, Surprise, Security, and the American Experience in 2004, and now, um, as many of you know tonight, uh, his most recent book, The Cold War, A New History. Um, I say this with some feeling as an English professor that his writing is uh, extraordinarily uh, beautiful, cultured, um, stylish, and yet uh, hi highly readable. Um, it really is extraordinary. The New York Times has called him the Dean of Cold War Historians, and he has won, of course, many honors, uh, including in 2005 the National Humanities Medal. But of all his honors, I'd like to point out the one that impresses me uh, most uh, when awarded to a scholar of his stature. In 2003, he was awarded the William Clyde Devane uh, Prize at 
uh, Yale University for undergraduate teaching. It isn't always that a scholar who's so productive and uh, operates at such a high level is so dedicated as well um, to te undergraduate teaching. I'd add to that that, in fact, the Gilder Lehrman Institute has been a beneficiary many times of his summer seminars for teachers. On at least four occasions, he's devoted a piece of his summer to, to running a seminar for secondary school teachers. Uh, at the end of the lecture this evening, there will be time for questions, uh, but I am at the moment delighted and proud to present to you Professor John Gaddis. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Jim, I think actually the reason you do second editions is inaccuracies in the first edition, because that's how you correct them. <laughs> it's um, a pleasure to be here tonight. It uh, uh, reflects a long connection, actually, with the Gilder Lehrman program, because one of the first things that happened to me when I came to Yale, David Brian Davis said to me, you will be involved with the Gilder Lehrman program, and he was right. I have been, very much to my benefit. Uh, so a tribute Dick, to you and to your great colleague, Luke. Ladies and gentlemen, the um, Bush administration has only a little more than a year and a half left in office. I wanted to start with that statement. First of all, because nobody can disagree with it. And secondly, Secondly, because I think it's always good to have a collective sigh of relief come at the beginning of the lecture rather than at the end of the lecture. <laughs> However, I would like to point out that if we had been here in April of 1999 and I had said much the same thing about the Clinton administration, the reaction would probably have been similar given the Lewinsky scandal of the year before, as it probably would have been if we had been here toward the end of the Reagan administration in April of 1987, given the Iran-Contra scandal of the year before, as it might have been even for the Eisenhower administration if we had been here in April of 1959, given Sputnik and the missile gap and the Sherman Adams Vicuña coat scandal of the year before. This one may require a little bit of research on Wikipedia for the younger members of the audience. <laughs> and this is leaving aside all of the administrations that ended because of their unpopularity before they were constitutionally required to end. So I have in mind the administrations of the first President Bush as well as uh, Presidents Carter Ford, Nixon, Johnson, and particularly Truman, who was down to a 26% approval rating at the time he left office. And long before he left office, the jokes were flying to air is Truman. <laughs> now, what's striking about all of these presidents is how few of them have the reputation now that they did during their final years in office. In the realm of foreign policy, indeed, Truman has long been remembered for having presided over a golden age, even a kind of genesis, Dean Acheson suggested, when he titled his famous memoir, Present at the Creation. And the reputations of Eisenhower and increasingly Reagan are not far behind in rising in the estimation of historians. Nor is this pattern absent from earlier periods in American history. Look, for example, at the gap between the contemporary and the historical reputations of Woodrow Wilson, Abraham Lincoln, John Quincy Adams, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, even George Washington himself. I think proximity to precedents breeds weariness and disappointment and often contempt. Distance from precedents. If by that we mean their departure from office, the cooling of passions, the opening of documents, and proximity to the next presidents and to the mistakes they have